past your bow. Fly away. Fly away. <laughs> <laughs> Be free. You're free. You're free. Your hand you is, are Your hand is free. warm. I'm not sure what happened. Freak up. Oh, oh and he even called free. on his way in. That was a nice he did. <laughs> this is the story of a bird and the people who love it. So the wood thrush is a uh, small robin-shaped bird, American robin-shaped bird. The thrushes in particular to me are just kind of iconically bird. Like if you ask a kid to draw a bird, they usually draw a thrush, right? Like that image. It's brown and uh, has a perky little tail. And these big dots, brown dots all over, has a little white eye ring. This bird is very sharp. The colors are very sharp. Well, it's a beautiful bird because it's beautifully proportioned. It has a very white breast with the spots, a striking rufous brown color on the back. To me, if they're in the right light, they, they do look uh, very red. To me, they're like a rusty red. Rusty red, yeah. yeah. They're definitely beautiful creatures. They've got a lot of personality. They're charismatic. They're cool. <laughs> The wood thrush is a unique bird with flute-like songs that adds music to summer mornings along the eastern half of the United States. It is an important indicator species. Where it goes and what it does can tell us so much more about the health of our forests and communities. If you work toward wood thrush conservation, then you're working toward forest conservation. You know, and, that, and that's an important thing. They, they act as kind of an umbrella species for a whole suite of species that are like that. That makes them a great candidate for folks to, to do science on, to do citizen science on. Um, it's just a great, great species to work on. And of course, everybody loves the way they sound. <laughs> Even if they've never seen one, they know what it sounds like. You know, it's just a great, iconic bird. The Climate Listening Project wanted to learn more about the wood thrush, how this one bird was connecting and inspiring people around the world, and the threat it's facing because of habitat fragmentation and climate change. The wood thrush spends its summers breeding in woodland areas throughout the eastern United States. We met with Forsyth Audubon, a chapter in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to hear the story of their wood thrush project. We went out and surveyed all over here, um, listening for birds and finding where they were, were located and made this map from, from that survey. So tell me about how we're going to find this location and, and find the location where the wood thrush came back okay, to. These are all the locations of all the birds. Okay, and this is the particular one that was recaptured um, and we have the GPS coordinates of that. So we're going to head toward the GPS coordinates for that bird. Mm. In 2014, the Forsyth Audubon chapter raised enough to fund two years of the Wood Thrush Project, an effort to tag, track, and learn the information needed to help this important species. They researched with scientists from the Smithsonian's Migratory Connectivity Project, along with Audubon North Carolina, the National Audubon Society, and the Audubon International Alliances Program. More than 500 hours were logged by community members helping with this project. A tiny new state-of-the-art technology could possibly provide the GPS data needed to show the route of the wood thrush's migration and exactly what habitats and important bird areas they're depending on. What happened next was more than anyone expected. So we're standing on a ridge between the initial capture location, which was over on that ridge. We had a set of nets downhill there and a set going diagonally up the ridge. And then in 2015, we caught, recaptured the birds up on this ridge behind us, um, again with multiple net sets and playback, but it was the first net 
run of the morning that we caught the bird. <laughs> which is just really kind of amazing. <laughs> to their amazement, after one year of migration, a wood thrush was recaptured. Defying all odds, the geolocator backpack and migration data were intact. Everybody goes off to check nets, and what do you find in the net? <laughs> First thing I saw was a wood thrush. And <laughs> I, I, I was amazed. I mean, I was thrilled. I really was. And I thought, I looked and I said, oh my goodness, I have to be really careful. I can't lose this guy. <laughs> They discovered the wood thrush had journeyed over 3,000 miles, round trip from North Carolina to the small Caribbean nation of Belize, and back to the same exact location in Pilot Mountain the following spring. This migration pattern created a special connection between North Carolina and Belize. The wood thrush depends not only on its breeding and wintering grounds, but also on its entire migration path. So we traveled with Kim Brand of Forsyth Audubon and Audubon, North Carolina to explore this connection. The wood thrush, I would say, of chocolate color. His back is brown and he has some um, brown spots and white spots at the bottom on his belly. It's a cute little bird. Clean white belly with some uh, dark spots all over. Um, it's, it's unmistakable, really. That, that um, orangish back is, is really stands out, even if it's in the middle of the forest. Belize is a beautiful country with lush forests that provide the perfect habitat for migratory birds to spend the winter. We set out to follow the path that our wood thrush tracked throughout the country, exploring the beautiful and diverse ecosystems, making new friends, and racking up life birds along the way. We traveled from the coastal keys on the Belize Barrier Reef to Crooked Tree Wildlife Sanctuary, a protected area recognized as a wetland of international importance. And deep into the rainforest at Coxcomb Basin Wildlife Sanctuary, a jaguar preserve in the foothills of the Maya Mountains. The kind people of Belize welcomed us, sharing their stories and love of the wood thrush. Would you like to hear its song? Yeah. Okay. What do you think? They actually make like three noise, right? Like, they will speak a different one than... Exactly, oh. but they're actually here in Belize more of the year than they're I know, in like, the States, yeah, right? They're with you longer. But they, over there, they make babies down here, not. They just come and eat here. That's right. Like, you see the one that I heard there when it flew? Mm -hmm. That was a different song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These birds make these amazing journeys, hundreds of miles every year, to return back to Belize to share this habitat. Those stories are important. It's not just a bird you see flying around. It's an amazing creature that's able to do that journey and come back. We need to ensure that their habitat is here, it's protected. Animals don't have boundaries. Animals go from North America to Central America to South America, and it's where the habitats are. Um, they don't think in defined lines, oh, I'm going to Mexico for my winter. It's really where the habitat is best. So the science and the studies and the experience we had with Forsyth really showed the connectivity, but it also helped people to really make the connectivity and that from a conservation point of view you can't have just one group doing their work we have to do it holistically because if the wintering grounds are lost then the species is still in trouble. Well the 
this is why my Audubon friends in North Carolina love this bird so much. It's for this song. I'm going to play it for you. Nice song. It's different every time. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Song, yeah. <laughs> and it's so amazing to hear these um, birds singing, you know, like, you know, these birds are all the way from USA and coming to mm -hmm. do their singing here, not all the time, but like, like uh, about to leave, mm -hmm. to leave our country saying goodbye for us again. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So that's the only time they sing yeah, for you, like, is to say goodbye. Yeah, goodbye, before, goodbye, they, before the, they head off. Yeah, you know. Our wood thrush had spent most of its time in the Cayo district of Belize, near the ancient Mayan city of Caracol. We ventured out to the archaeological site with an expert birding guide to find out why. It's amazing. Actually, the bird that we um, had wintering right around Caracol, if it wasn't for you guys, we would never know where this bird went. I mean, we just would know that it would winter here and that's it. Um, but thanks to, you know, the collaboration that we have now, we can know that it winters here, but it goes back to North Carolina to breed. And hopefully the following winter, it's gonna be here with us again. We are right now here at Caracol. And you can see it's very close to the border with Guatemala. It's actually just about four or five kilometers. And if you look off to the distance, mm -hmm. it's the massive Chiquibo forest that we still have around. And it's all dense, broadleaf, intact ecosystem. Our wood thrush was just about two to three kilometers actually northwest from where we are. In very similar habitat to this all dense, broadleaf forest. Nice. So in that Right over there, our wood thrush spent all of last winter. Yeah. Wow. Banned yeah. in North Carolina. And spent came the winter. all the way here. In Belize. <laughs> to you. <laughs> to yes. your backyard and made it all the way back to North Carolina. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. The tropical forests of Belize provide the perfect habitat for the wood thrush in the winter, where it eats and gets ready for a long migration north each spring. This area was where the uh, wood thrush actually spent the winter. And you can see why, I mean, it has a nice canopy above. And if you look on the ground, this is actually really good stuff. I mean, the wood thrush loves areas like these with a lot of decaying matter. Mm -hmm because they come around and you know they just toss leaves up looking for food. As you saw back at Caracol, I mean, just a little bit further towards Guatemala, I mean, the forest is, is disappearing. So it's actually less suitable habitat for wood thrush, but in areas of good forest like this, then there's a higher um, likelihood for wood thrushes to spend the winter and a few other um, migratory species. The wood thrush is at risk. In addition to habitat fragmentation, climate change is resulting in more extreme weather, including changes in temperature and precipitation that can affect where birds survive. The way climate change works on a bird is kind of at the individual level. We often think of birds that are vulnerable to climate change as having to kind of pick up and move. Actually, for a lot of our land birds, that's not how it works. You know, the bird tries to stay where he was born, where he's been raising young. Wood thrush can live to be 10 or 12 years old in the wild, and they do come back to the same places year after year. The food that they depend on gets stressed, reduces. The forest that they depend on is stressed. What happens is that individual bird, that, that male and female that are trying to raise babies, aren't as successful. And so if you look at those maps a lot of times, you start out with this dense yellow, and it becomes just this kind of pale yellow as all the birds kind of wink out of that space. So to me, that's why it's really important to work to make the habitat that we've got just as productive as it can possibly be. You know, protect the forest, make the forest as resilient as possible to climate change, and that makes the wood thrush and other forest birds as resilient to climate change as possible. It's lost 60% uh, of its uh, population over the last 40 years. Now that's uh, an alarm bell that's going off 
in a lot of people's minds. Um, and we could actually, this could be one of the species that we see blink out in a very short space of time if we're unable to pull out all the resources and ensure that there is enough habitat for them to survive and the conditions in those habitats are um, okay for them to survive um, over the long term. The birds really put it into focus in terms of the fact that the problems we are facing are everywhere. Habitat destruction, climate change, impacts to protected areas, all of them are being experienced globally and I think the birds are messengers. The people in my village, they do a lot of traditional farming. Um, now they have been seeing that these people no longer can plant. The season when they used to plant, it has changed. The weather pattern has changed, and therefore they need to change their um, agricultural techniques as well. But these are new concepts, and they don't know about these things. And therefore, like using a word to explain to them what is happening, what is changing these things, I think it's very important, it's unique. You know, it's like a bird speaking to us, telling us, hey, something is wrong, you know? The songs of birds is what really people identify to. Um, even if you're not a conservationist, even if you wouldn't call yourself an environmentalist, if, if it were to go silent, I think we would all notice. So I think that is really where, where we need to all take action and decide what kind of future you want and how we want to move forward. We can take action starting in our own backyards by growing native plants. Yeah, we moved here and we got married and this was all at one time just briars and moss. And um, we little by little started taking all the invasive non-native things out and driving all over North Carolina finding native plants that would work for us. And um, we've got I think about 10 spice bush plants and red bud five service berry trees, dogwood, sumac, blackberry, blueberry, chokeberry, viburnums, arrowwood, arrowwood all kinds of mm -hmm. just native, anything we could see on the internet that was good for birds, we bought it and we're planting it. I think anybody, especially new homeowners, they could plant at least one tree, one bush, or even flowers. Because um, even though we're big about birds, you know, bees and butterflies benefit too. You know, they pollinate the flowers and the trees that will in turn you know, benefit the birds. We drive like two, three hours and I'm hungry and got to stop and get water or something like that. And, and they fly thousands of miles, some of them, you know, they need, they don't have many McDonald's for birds around, you know, especially when they're cutting it down and building factories or Walmarts or whatever. So mm -hmm. we hope they could find our little spot here in King to stop or live, whatever they want to do. Protecting our forests is the first step towards full life cycle conservation. These areas, you know, they're few and far between anymore and a lot of them are becoming fragmented. So state parks really establish a large tracts of land that can serve as habitat for these areas and these birds to come and, and reproduce and not be disturbed. I actually started a program to bring folks that wanted to come out and go bird watching. I called it a thrush trek. Um, so essentially we would, you know, walk around, look for wood thrush, listen to their song. Um, you know, it's a very, very melodic song. So, you know, being able to point that out to people that don't know the bird is, you know, really inspiring. With sort of a bipartisan support, uh, we could really create um, the situations, I guess, the, the recipe for um, keeping a lot of what we see today around so that our future generations can experience it. I think the economy side of climate change is just as important as the other, um, the, the natural side, because that's a good way to make people pay attention if it's going to shift their spending habits. You can't have the wood thrush without having the nature behind it. You can't you know, pave over everything and expect to still hear the wood thrush every summer and you know, enjoy their song and enjoy seeing them. So you, you have to have them both. And if the wood thrush is important to you, then saving their environment should be important to you also. 
Farmers are welcoming birds and pollinators on their farms. Cacao is important for survival of many species of animals, including birds, including human beings. But there is a constant degradation of rainforests. But what does cacao do is it encourages you to reforest so that the birds can continue to live. So we plant fruiting trees like bananas, plantains, guava trees, and wild fruits for the birds to enjoy so that they do not only feed on the pods of the cacao tree, but also feed on other things. So it is a symbiotic form of living. Around the world, bird guide trainings and education programs are creating opportunities. With Belize Audubon Society and several other partners, we managed to roll out the first ever uh, bird guide training program. And this was focused around the protected areas that Belize Audubon manages. And it was a great opportunity for all these young guys that live or work around the protected areas to actually learn a little bit more on the natural history and bird identification and they can actually start taking tourists into these protected areas like Coxcomb, Crooked Tree and St. Herman's Blue Hole. And you know, they're using the areas but responsibly and they're, they're making money out of it. But they also want to keep it as it is so that they can keep going back um, and you know, sustain a livelihood in there. I see that now, instead of just teaching people that birds are important for the environment, the migration story is powerful. And that's what we're now teaching to the children so that they can understand that concept of migration. And so it has, it has worked very well. We've established junior bird clubs in the communities. And so the children are now seeing economic value also in protecting birds. And that one day they can pursue a career that's conservation related or bird tourism related. And so that's key. Well, I love birds and I would continue to love birds until I die. And I always have to say that I, I appreciated the job that I am in, that I could continue to educate people that birds are important for the environment. And if we lose the bird, definitely we'll lose part of the ecosystem. The head of our education department, she goes out and she talks with the corporations around about certain things about climate change and the Lights Out program. She also talks to the young folks, which I think is one of the key things that we have to do as the ambassadors for Audubon. We need to get more young folks involved because we need to pass the torch to them. That's why I think it's important that we do get the young folks involved. Not only did the Forsyth Audubon's Woodthrush Project provide important data about this climate vulnerable species, it connected people and communities around the world. This should create the capacity to make um, informed decisions about what's happening and what we need to do as a global community in combating challenges uh, in terms of conservation, climate change, land use, uh, in the future. Following the journey of our wood thrush, the Climate Listening Project learned how we can all work together to protect the birds we love. I'm